So he's uh, fantastic. Okay. Good. So um, I know a couple of people can't make it today. Um, I know Elizabeth can't make it and Seb um, and Steve Watson also um, has sent his apologies, but um, it's just a very busy time at the moment, I think. Um, I sh shall, we make a, sh shall we make a start? And if, if other people come in, I don't, how many people have you invited, Peter? Oh, about at least half a dozen, maybe more. Okay, all right. Well, but then maybe they'll. It maybe they'll matter, okay, no, people are still drifting in. Um, so, so this. Wait for five minutes. Yeah. Well, wait for five minutes anyway. Yeah, we can and, wait. Uh, wait for five minutes. Ah, there's Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hello, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> um, can, can I request everybody, since we're recording it, that w when we do record it, uh, um, that you turn your microphones off mm. because that'll make the recording better. And maybe cameras because that will be more bandwidth. That'll be bandwidth as well, yeah. So cameras, I mean, we're all so beautiful. We all want to see each other, obviously. Yeah, obviously. If, well, well, I'll be thinking of you while I'm talking. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be spooky. But uh, yeah, no, forget, yeah, good idea for cameras too. Is, is this a good angle, this? Because is, is, your angle is fine, Peter. Right, okay. it's very good, Peter. Good man. Okay. Uh, Arnie's very keen on getting the right angle. <laughs> And yeah, we're learns. continuous product improvement here as we uh, as, as we learn from these things. It's uh, okay. Yeah. So I, I just wonder if I can give a bit a bit of background to this group. So this really started as a um, uh, an encounter between um, Peter's work and the work of John Torday. John, I don't know if you can um, just introduce yourself and just say something about your work in biology and and the connection to Peter. <clears throat> okay, am I muted? No, you're fine. So I'm formerly um, on the faculty at uh, UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, although I'm um, being televised from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I grandparent. On the side, it's a living. Uh, my background is actually, my <laughs> formal training is in fetal endocrinology. I spent 50 years in the laboratory uh, as a funded investigator. And about 20 years ago, I had a brainstorm that if I took the mechanism of embryologic development, which we had stumbled on while I was still a grad student, cell cell signaling, and I applied that to phylogeny speciation, they actually had the basis for understanding evolution from its origins. So I've written about 100 peer reviewed papers and six books, another one in. Uh, in the works on this subject, and um, I find it very interesting. Um, I emailed to Mark the other day to say it's quite extraordinary to me that, in my opinion anyway, Peter's mathematics, his rewrite system actually is, I believe, homologous with what I've said about cell signaling in many ways, and I guess my reduction of that is that the mathematics is in David, uh, is in Bohm's implicate order, my work is in the explicate in the sense that it's subjective, but the science actually brings you closer and closer to the implicate order, and I think that's really what the science should be doing. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, so I mean, we have a lot of physicists here, so um, I know um, uh, a lot of people are quite familiar with David Bohm and um, are actively I don't, I don't know what to say because I'm out of my depth, actually. Maybe, Peter, you should, you should say something, or John, John Williamson. Well, uh, the Implicate Order, Bohm's Implicate Order, is a very, very beautiful book, and if it's got anything to do with the Implicate Order, I'd be interested in that anyway. From, but that sounds extremely interesting, what you just said there. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm looking... Uh, Peter, Peter will be, I think, familiar with this as well. This is a conversation that would be interesting to have by itself, just talking about that book. <laughs> so that well, what I'm saying will be implicate order. Implicate, good man, my favourite. <laughs> good. Yeah. Stuff of dreams, eh? <laughs> Fantastic. You're saying it will be explicate, though, I assume. It will be <laughs> explicate. Implicate yeah. will be explicated. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I said something I said to you, Mark, that I think is valid. So I've always loved that. Um, I've read uh, um, Isaacson's uh, biography of Einstein, and he, he relates that dream that Einstein had as a 16-year-old traveling in tandem with a, a beam of light. 
which I assume was the basis, not the clock tower in Switzerland, but in fact, that was the basis for the three papers in 1905. And what I'm pointing to is the fact that Einstein's physiology was in sync with the cosmos and he all of a sudden had this epiphany. So I think that, that that's what I really want, I would like to talk about ultimately, that merging of the, the, the physiology and the, bio, and the, and the cosmology um, as, as a unity. I actually published a paper on the singularity of nature. Uh, <laughs> audacity, maybe. <laughs> But if you gentlemen, those of you who are not familiar with the stuff that uh, Peter and, and I are doing and Mark, Mark to in Quicycle, if you just look at quicycle.com, you'll find some of Peter and my talks up there already on some of the things that we're thinking about there. This is not, but Quicycle is not limited to physics or mathematics. It's supposed to be for the furtherance of pure science. So have a look, and if people want to get involved on that in the basis of coming in and uh, saying things which they feel to be important, then, um, then um, don't just look at the website, get in touch with me and I'll, um, and I'll involve you in. Yeah. I'll put a link to the website in the chat. I think I should Good. start soon. I think you yeah. should start. So um, well, can we, the same if, we, yeah. if, we mute, if we mute ourselves and yeah. then Peter can... Uh, can fire away. Ah, something that should say present now somewhere. Right. I'm, I'm looking to see how I do it. I know how do it on the other system I've used. How do I do it? You need to share screen. So if you look down at the bottom of your yeah, screen, share screen. Yeah. you see a big green button. Yeah. And then I need to... I'm not exactly sure with Zoom where you proceed from there, but it's similar. Okay. I think so it's easier. You, you, you s click on share screen and the first option yeah. that it highlights is screen. So you just click on share in the bottom right hand corner. Oh, that one. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Lovely. And then can I, am I, can I you start can just now? load up your PowerPoint now? So we're looking at your email at the moment. Yeah. Well, let okay. me knock that off. I'm yeah, hoping it doesn't knock everything off. Yeah, now I will put the PowerPoint up and put it on um, slideshow from the beginning. Okay. We okay now? Yes, we see, I see it perfectly. Off you go. Well, I'm going to begin in a few minutes because in the other system I say I'm about to begin and then I leave a few seconds and then begin. I'm about to begin. Well, I'm going to talk about a hidden symmetry, which I hope will be exposed fully when I've finished talking. And what I'm going to say is that nature goes for simple options and it always goes for the simplest. But if you look at physics, it's nothing like simple. What we've got is quantum mechanics, general relativity, two competing theories. They seem to contradict each other and neither is simple. We've also got this fantastically, brilliantly successful mo standard model of particle physics, which has been in place since the 1970s and hasn't changed since then. And we've still not go got any fundamental explanation, though, though we've got billions of experimental results supporting it. So how do we get out of this chaotic mess into something that might be what nature is doing? This is the current state of affairs. We got four interactions, primary forces, 12 states of matter and 12 antistates, that's the fermions. The bosons are really not primary. Numerous measurement parameters, space, time, mass, angular momentum, all that kind of thing. And a lot of arbitrary seeming laws which connect them. So the universe seems to be inexplicable intrinsically though we've got all this stuff to help us to understand aspects of it. So how are we gonna make, make sense of that? Well, first of all, we're not going to imagine something even more complicated than we got. It's gotta be simpler. So we don't want turtles all the way down. So we don't wanna build assumption on assumption on assumption according to the old story. And we don't want a just so story. It's quite easy just to come up with a just-so story. Well, that's not what it must be. That's no good at all. It's got to be from something more fundamental. This is more like what we want, a Rosetta Stone. 
to discover, decipher the hieroglyphics of physics. So perhaps there's a hidden structure which will show where we get all the apparent complications from, something much, much simpler. So what we tend to do quite often is treat our highly sophisticated, high level theories as the fundamental language. And that's not good enough. What we need is something much more elementary, elemental. And we have to ask the question, if nature is simple, why does it look complex? So what's the trick that nature performs to make the intrinsically simple end up by building complications on complications? Is there any clue that we can lead us back from the complex to the simple? Well, I say there is one, and it's the only one that's ever been found to work. And it's based on the only talent that we've developed along with our ev evolution, pattern recognition. The conjurer's trick, doing it by mirrors, symmetries. Because everywhere in nature, and especially in physics, there are hints that symmetry is the key to deeper understanding. And one of the things about physics symmetries is that they're often broken. They're not in perfect form quite often. Some are, but many aren't. Disguised or hidden in some way. And space and time is a classic one. We, we, we know that we can combine them in relativity, but they still remain obstinately different physically. So why is there that broken symmetry between those? It may be that these broken symmetries may well offer the clue because our instincts tell us that nature shouldn't break symmetries at the most fundamental level. They should be perfect. There's no reason why nature should break symmetries in fundamental terms. And symmetry breaking should be a sign of complexity or emergence. And in my view, Break, broken symmetries are often not what people think they are. They're not broken symmetries. They're often merging of more than one symmetry, which compete with each other. And so if we look at broken symmetries, we might get the clues about the original, possibly simpler symmetries from which they emerged. So the probability is there's some hidden structure which appears to us broken, but it has to be simple. So where do we look? Well, I've been doing this for a very long time, many decades, and I know where I look, and it seems to be productive. We go to the simplest level we can imagine, and I say that's the parameters, the things we actually observe or construct the universe out of. The only ways we've ever had of actually devising an understanding of the world about us. And I think we've got to go for those ideas which are present at every level of complexity. That's why we think space and time are significant because they're always there all, all at every level, whatever level we choose. On the other hand, solidity isn't fundamental because it tends to disappear at the most fundamental level. And then we can look at concepts like force, acceleration, angular momentum, temperature. These are very important physical concepts, but they're not fundamental because they're composites. We can always express these in a composite way using what we call dimensional analysis. So we have to go for the things that we can't do that with. So which are the simplest, the most elementary? Well, as I mentioned already, space is fundamental. Nobody, physicist, philosopher, anybody else has ever thought otherwise. And there's something interesting about space. It has this structure, three-dimensional structure, and that's got to be interesting in itself, that fundamental quantity has this structure. Also time, nobody's ever, well, there are people who think time doesn't exist, but there's something that has to take the place of it, even if, even if it's supposedly non-existent. And then what else is that? Well, if we look at fundamental physics, the only things that happen in the whole of physics are interactions, physical interactions between particles, but we'll say more about that. And there are only four of them. Everything's been reduced to four interactions. And gravity is, is certainly one of them, but there are three others that have, have got a kind of similarity, but also differences. And 
if people are not familiar with these, then just think about radioactivity. There are three main types of radioactivity, alpha, beta, and gamma. And we think, oh, they're just radioactivity. However, these three main types couldn't be more different from each other if they tried. They're the most different things in the whole of the universe. But they're not alike at all. Because alpha comes from the strong force, the force that holds the protons together in the nucleus, the force that holds the proton itself together from the quarks. The weak force is the destroyer, the one that emits neutrinos and changes the nature of particles, unlike other forces. And the electromagnetic force is very familiar to us, of course, in both electricity and magnetism. So these are a spectacular example of a broken symmetry. These forces are alike in some respects, but strikingly different in others. And why is this? There are only four forces. Why are they so different? Well, the source of gravity we know is mass. I know that people say it's energy, but energy and mass mean the same thing at this level that I'm talking about. I don't mean discrete mass. I'll talk about that in a different context later. So what about the others? Well, we, there is an idea around which has some traction that these are a kind of broken symmetry which under ideal conditions would be perfect. So let's assume that that's possible. Let's assume the ideal conditions. And I'm going to call the source charge because that's the source of the electromagnetic interaction. And ideally, the other two should look like that. And partially they do, but not totally. So I'm going to call it charge. And this is an, um, a concept I've had for many, many years. And it was very much disliked when I first started talking about it. But now everybody talks about weak and strong charges, just as, as I, I have always done. Now, it, this discovery of a broken symmetry is the clue to find in the hidden structure. So why are they so different when they should be similar? So can we project to what should be there before the symmetry is broken? And I'm not here going to invoke some sort of thing that happened in the past, some big bang mechanism or something. This is a fundamental aspect of physics. It's got to be true all the time. And so, if I want to understand this, I've got to searchingly investigate these four parameters, these elementary parameters, and look at them. And I'm going to pair them off with each other in different ways. And the first one, these are the four parameters I'm going to investigate. Uh, I'm going to mention at first that mass is regarded as a source of gravitational field, mass energy, not rest mass. And of course, there's no such thing ever observed as rest mass. We never observe a particle at rest. And I'm going to say charge is the generic term for the source of the electric strong and weak interactions. And it behaves like a three dimensional parameter like space does. And I'm going to say that the perfect symmetry between the electric strong and weak charges is broken at normal energies. But it's believed that under some ideal condition called grand unification, all three charge terms will be exactly alike. So let's look at space first of all. Now, it's, it's several people have tried to model the whole of nature on space. Descartes is famous for doing it. Extension only, that was his only property. Um, Einstein, to a certain extent, tried to make everything an aspect of space. And why do we do this? Well, it's because space has a unique property. It's the only parameter that can be measured. We can't actually measure any of the others. Whenever we do any other measurement, we're actually observing a point of moving over a scale or something equivalent, counting oscillations or whatever, something that's to do with space. Now you can measure space with any object whatsoever. All objects create a measurement of space. But if we try to measure time, we've got to produce special conditions in which we get a repetition of the same interval, isochronous system in some way. And it, 
we don't really measure time, we measure the spatial intervals and how many times we do it. The same if you'd measure mass, if you measure mass on a balance, you're really measuring a, a point of moving. And of course, charge, it can only measure that as a force between two charges, which involves space again. So only space can be measured. That's, it's an interesting fact that our whole entertainment industry depends on the fact that space is the only thing we can measure because we simulate all the other things, time and, and things and matter and so on by things in space, like films, holography, sound recording, it's all really spatial. So measurability is not a universal aspect of nature. And I have always believed that nothing is a universal aspect of nature. Nothing whatsoever is. We, we always have to counterbalance anything we claim to represent nature. Because if we make any assumption, what will happen is that we will eventually um, reach the asymptotic level of our own assumptions. We won't find anything really new. That's what will happen. So I'm going to assume that I've done enough iterations to, to believe that this is the, start, the starting point. And believe me, I couldn't tell you how many iterations I've done, so many. And that we're going to hope that our sophisticated high level theories will emerge from packages composed of these elements. And that symmetry, this is a very important point, this last one. Symmetry breaking is an aspect of the packing, packaging and not of the fundamental nature of the constituents. And I'm going to say that that means that symmetry breaking is local, whereas the parameters themselves are global. I'll say more about that. So here we start. And this is the first division between the parameters, conserved and non-conserved. Two have the conserved property and two are non-conserved. Let's have a look to see what this means. Well, some of the most fundamental laws, the ones that are least likely to be ever broken are about conservation. Conservation of mass and energy, conservation of charge are fundamental laws and they haven't been broken. On the other hand, non-conservation isn't just the absence of conservation, it's a property, it's a very definite property in its own way. And it is in every way the complete opposite of conservation. I'll give you some examples. Non-conserved quantities have no identity. One unit of the quantity is good as any other. We have the translation symmetry of time. One moment in time is the same as any other. We can't tell the difference. The translation symmetry of space, one position in space, one, one uh, piece of space is the same as any other. Rotation symmetry of space, the one direction in space is the same as any other. These are fundamental principles. We can contrast that by example with the conserved quantities because these are, and it's never normally said, but these are translation and rotation asymmetric, asymmetric. Each unit is unique, you can't replace one by another. The translation asymmetry of mass, you don't replace one element by another. The identity of mass. The translation asymmetry of charge, you don't replace one element of charge by another. The rotation asymmetry of charge, now this is a very important one, it means we've got three charges. Let's imagine there are, we represent them on three axes. We cannot rotate those axes. So an electric charge cannot become a strong charge, cannot become a weak charge. Three types of charge do not rotate into each other. They're separately conserved. And we have two well-known laws in particle physics, baryon and lepton conservation. The baryon is the only particle which has the strong charge. So it can't decay into another particle which doesn't have it, like a pion or something, or a positron. It can only decay into a particle with a strong charge. And this is why proton decay has never been observed. 
because that's the lightest baryon and it can't decay into another baryon, and so it can't decay. Lepton conservation, well, baryons and leptons are the only particles with weak charges, but leptons don't have strong charges, so they can't decay into baryons and they can't decay into anything else but other leptons. So that's conservation. Let's go back to non-conservation. We have some physical principles that are clearly non-conservation principles. The gauge invariance, which means that field terms are unchanged if we arbitrarily change potential. Now, potential in electricity is what we call voltage. In electricity, that's potential. And there's a similar gravitational potential. Roughly speaking, they're either mass or charge over distance. And what happens is that the mass or charge is the conserved bit and the distance is not conserved. So it's completely arbitrary you know, which position we, we measure a potential from. It's well known that if you, you measure the gravitational potential it depends on the height above the Earth's surface. But I could um, measure it from the height of a table or I can measure it from the height above the Earth's surface. And it still doesn't make any difference which one you put into the equation. It's arbitrary. What does make a difference is the mass and charge concept. And if you're a familiar one from your car battery, it says Earth on it, but it doesn't touch Earth. It, that, that zero potential on the battery, the negative plate, is not at Earth at all. It's connected to the chassis of the car, which is insulated from Earth. So it's not at Earth potential. But it doesn't make any difference that it isn't at Earth potential because that uh, distance doesn't really matter. We only ever measure differences in potentials. We never measure absolute ones. So we can make any arbitrary changes in the coordinates which don't produce changes in the conserved quantities. Charge, momentum, angular momentum, energy. And then another aspect of non-conservation why on earth do we have these terrible things called differential equations? Physics doesn't use ordinary equations normally, it uses differential equations, rates of change of quantities, because we can't get directly at the quantities. And what these are doing, th these are taking the non-conserved quantities, space and time, and saying the rate of space change with time, or the rate of space change with time, and then the rate of that change with time, are the fundamental things, not the space and the time. And these ensure that the conserved quantities, mass and charge and things derived from them, energy, momentum and angular momentum, remain unchanged while the conserved quantities vary absolute, non-conserved quantities, the variable ones vary absolutely. This means that the non-conserved or variable quantities are expressed in physics equations as differentials, dx, dt. That makes physics very difficult because it's on differential equations. That makes it a lot harder than if it wasn't, which directly express this variation. Let's go to the quantum state for the moment. And the idea that God plays dice in the quantum state, well, that doesn't worry me. I'm happy if God plays dice. Because if we accept the logic of defining space and time as non-conserved quantities, then we can't fix them and they should be subject to absolute variation on one condition, that conservation principles continue to hold. So your non-conservation is absolute up to the level where conservation applies. So I'll give you an example. We have a free electron. We can, that free electron is anywhere in space. Suppose we bring it by some means near a proton then the, the, the electron can have any position it likes with respect to that proton, as long as the conservation principles defining that system still hold. Conservation of angular momentum, conservation of charge, conservation of energy. They've got to hold. So if we bring that system up to another, that's a hydrogen atom, if we bring it up to another hydrogen atom, create a molecule, then we'll create new conservation principles which further restrict the, the positions of the electrons and so on until we build large structures which have so many conservation principles restricting them 
that, that we don't notice any variation. And we make classical measurements. I, I personally am not, you know, I don't really talk about collapse of the wave function because I think it's always there. There's a well-known mathematical theorem, Noether's theorem, after Emmy Noether, that says that to every variation property, variational properties is a conserved quantity. Now you can see that to, to, to me, that says conservation, non-conservation, always go together. And this theorem says that gives some examples, the translation symmetry of time and the conservation of energy are the same thing that can be shown mathematically. The translation symmetry of space and the conservation of momentum are the same thing. And the rotation symmetry of space and the conservation of angular momentum are the same thing. And I'm saying this theorem is a natural consequence of defining conservation and non-conservation properties symmetrically. For one, you get the always get one or the other. And I found it was possible to extend these examples by adding two new ones. Um, we know from relativity that the energy is the same as the mass I'm talking about. So energy is related, conservation of energy and conservation of mass are related. And these are the symmetry of time translation. So if mass is involved in this, then charge must be as well. And so what's left for charge? It must be angular momentum and momentum. And those in red in the middle of the table, those are the ones that I've proposed. Now, if we look at the principle of gauge invariance, we can see that there's some justification for the first one, magnitude of charge being the same as momentum, space translation, non-conservation of space, conservation of charge. Now, that's possible. But what on earth does the, the, the last one mean, type of charge? It means that, according to this principle, the fact that you can't check, rotate electric to strong to weak is the same as the conservation of angular momentum? Well, I found that really baffling at first, and I asked many mathematicians to help me with it, and none of them came up with anything or even tried to. They just thought this was you know, not important, but I think it's very important, very important indeed. It seems totally bizarre. Why, why is the conservation of angular momentum the same thing as the conservation of the type of charge? And this is what the reason is which I've eventually found out. Angular momentum conservation is three separate conservation laws. Magnitude, direction, and handedness, whether it's left or right, according to your system. And those three, are pre those precisely involved in the U1, SU3, and SU2 symmetries involved with electric strong and weak charges. And if you like, the conservation laws of magnitude of direction and handedness are really saying that the spherical symmetry of three-dimensional space is preserved by a rotating system. And it doesn't matter what the length of the radius vector is, it doesn't matter what system of action you choose, and it doesn't matter whether we choose to rotate left or right-handed. And these are totally independent considerations. Three conservation laws. Angular momentum is three conservation laws, hence gyroscopes and stuff like that. So that's the first property. Now the second one is a totally mathematical concept, real and imaginary. By real, I mean squaring to positive values. By imaginary, I mean squaring to negative values, what we call norm one and norm minus one. And we can split them up in this way. Mass and space are real. Time and charge are imaginary. Notice we've changed the parameters always from the first slide. Now, let's look at space and time. Relativity combines space and time in a four vector with three real parts and one imaginary part, and the imaginary part is time. So if you write Pythagoras theorem in four dimensions, in three dimensions it will be r squared equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and it means that it doesn't matter which x, y, z you choose as long as you finally get r as the resultant. If we make it four dimensions, then we add minus c squared t squared, c being the velocity of light. And in most systems, we, we make c1. And so we can write that as x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus i squared, c squared t squared, where i is the normal square root of minus one. And we can write 
the thing that produces that, the four vector, as, as uh, three vector terms plus ICT. So clearly, according to relativity, we can represent space as uh, real and time as imaginary. Now let's look at mass and charge. There's an age-old problem of why identical masses attract and identical charges repel. And that's of any interactions, I will say, any, any of the three interactions. So the first equation there is Newton's law of gravitation. And the minus means that the, the force is attractive because it's instead of pushing out as the positive vector does, it pulls back. And, and notice it's minus constant and then m1, m2 over r squared. The second one is the Coulomb law of electric static repulsion between identical charges. And this time you've got a positive value for the force because you're pushing out, you're, you're repelling. Why don't those laws look the same? Well, the reason why they don't look the same is because charge is imaginary. And if you write an imaginary charge in there, you will get the same type of law as you get for Newton's law of gravitation. It looks exactly the same, but you've got IE instead of E. Okay, but we got three charges, electric, strong and weak. So are they alike? Well, I've already said they are. So there must be some way of having a three-dimensional imaginary quantity. Yes, of course there is. Hamilton discovered it in 1843 with three real part, three imaginary parts and one real part called the Quaternion system. And the amazing thing about this is it's unique. It can only be 3D unless you mess about with the algebra in incredible ways. It can only be 3D. Now Hamilton discovered quaternions when he was trying to extend the complex number system. He, there's a well-known representation of complex numbers called the Argandine, where you represent them in a plane, in a, in a pair of axes, real on the horizontal and imaginary on the vertical. He tried to extend that to three dimensions. And in doing so, he realized that he had the first ever and only known explanation for three dimensionality. So this is what he called his triplets or I think perhaps triads. Um, you see the real axis horizontal and the one of the, the I, the imaginary axis vertical, and he tried to have another axis J perpendicular to both. And this doesn't work, and the reason why it doesn't work is there's no product for ij. You can't find anything in the system which it is equivalent to ij. And so eventually, after a lot of struggle, he extended the imaginary numbers to three axes, which were rotational, ij equals k. And you can't any longer show the real dimension with them. You can only show the imaginary ones. There's just one small problem, if, and this is what held him up for so long that he was, every time he tried to do it, he found he got anti-commutative quaternions. And it wasn't until he accepted anti-commutativity was essential that he actually made the, his final breakthrough. So these are quaternions, they're all square roots of minus one, and ij doesn't equal ji equals minus ji it's anti-commutative then it equals k and the same with jk and ki they rotate but they're anti-commutative and it's very easy to show what how they're anti-commutative let's try well if we if they were commutative then ij and ji would both equal k so let's try multiplying aj by ji Let's multiply the j's first, that's minus one. So let's bring that outside and we got minus i, that's plus one, not minus one. If there were both k, then it would be minus one. So they're anti-commutative. One, one of the products has got to be plus one, uh, sorry, um, one of the products has got to be minus k and the other one k. This is very good because it explains three-dimensionality because you can't extend anti-commutative to work with more than three terms. And there are mathematical theorems done after Hamilton time, which prove that. So anti-commutativity is the same as three-dimensionality. It's the more fundamental idea is anti-commutativity. Now I know you can extend it to seven, 
but then you've got to be anti-associative, which is a real nightmare if you're trying to explain any physics. And you can't do it beyond seven at all. Now, Hamilton thought the imaginary part was space and the real part was time. And he, he thought he discovered a key to the universe. And lots of people said, what nonsense, absolute nonsense, terrible nonsense. And one of them was E.T. Bell, who wrote a book, Men of Mathematics, around about 1947, and said, never has a great mathematician been proved more hopelessly wrong. Well, in my opinion, it's the mediocre history, historian of science who's hopelessly wrong, not the great mathematician. Hamilton had actually discovered the key to three-dimensionality. Well, what, what more significant discovery could you make? And a great deal more besides. I've got his lectures behind me on, the, on this bookcase. If you multiply the quaternion units, and there's four because it's quaternion, there's four, there's the real part, one i, j, k by ordinary square root minus one i, they become a four vector with units i for the time variable and then the, four, the vector units i, j, k. Now, I, I, I normally write um, quaternions as bold italics and vectors as bold. And so you, you also anticipate the connection between space and time in relativity, as Hamilton did in his writings. He mentioned it quite a number of times. So space and time become a four vector with three real parts and one imaginary by symmetry with the mass and charge quaternion with three imaginary parts and one real. And we know that the, the charge one, the, the, the quaternion cannot be more than three. And as it happens, vectors like quaternions are also anti-commutative, which is why turning a screw thread one way is different to turning it the other. That's because space is anti-commutative as well. And that wasn't realized until then. And so we now have quaternions on the left-hand graph, um, mass charge and vectors, four vectors on the right-hand charge uh, graph. And notice the mass cannot be represented on the quaternion axis and the time cannot be represented on the vector axis. And the, the little diagram below is saying that the quaternions are not rotational whereas the vectors are. And there's a fantastic bonus. If we apply quaternionic multiplication rules to the space vector, we discover things about vectors we never knew before. This is what we call Clifford algebra. And this is what David Heston has uh, very successfully used in physics. And by, by doing this, we automatically incorporate the property of spin. There's nothing mysterious about it. It becomes an obvious consequence. Because we have a full product for these, we used to be taught that there was a vector product, a dot b, and a scalar product, a cross b, and that it had to be done differently and they didn't make any sense. But they do make sense because they don't have to be done separately. They're part of one big structure. Space and time are simply quaternions multiplied by i. And Hamilton was right all along. So are there any other advantages in doing real and imaginary descriptions? Well, yes, there's lots of advantages. When we do physics, we, we realize that quantities in time are not significant in physics. T quantities in time squared r. Acceleration and force drive everything in physics. And there, time squared. It's distance per time per time and mass times distance per time per time. There's double time measurement involved, time uh, parameter involved. And time measurement, or so-called, which is also it's not really time measurement, but even if you do what we call time measurement, always requires force and acceleration. And there's no one way speed of light. We can't measure time by sending a light signal. One way, we can only, we've got to reflect it back. And that always reminds me of Lewis Carroll's white king who had two messengers, one for going and one for coming back. But we can't actually do that. We've got to have the same messenger. So imaginary quantities are also algebraically dual and real ones aren't. It, that means that if you've got positive solutions, you can only have them if you've also got negative ones. 
So all charges, if they're imaginary of some kind, they have to have solutions for both sides. And this is why we have to have antiparticles or antistates, which don't have to have opposite masses, as we'll explain later. They only have to have opposite charges. And even things that don't have an electric charge, like a neutrino, have an antiparticle, an antineutrino. But things that don't have any charges at all, like the photon, are their own antiparticles. And this is another thing that tell, indicates you know, what's real and what's imaginary. Mass is real and we can detect it in two different ways. We can do it through inertia, that's just mass, not mass squared, or we can do it through gravity, which is mass squared. But we can't do charge directly, we can only do that as squared because it's imaginary. We've got to have a force between two charges if you had one charge in the universe, it would never know it was a charge. It has to have another charge to, to interact with for us to know it's there. So finally, we come to the last division. And this is, this is the one that for years was the most contentious. And it, it meant I had to search for a mathematics I didn't know exist, but it does exist. So this is the divisible and indivisible. And this is where we do a different pairing again, space and charge against mass and time. So I'm saying mass as we were talking about this kind of mass, global mass as I call it, not local mass, mass energy, it's a continuum, present everywhere. We got the Higgs field, we know that's there. We got vacuum, we know that's where the Higgs field is. We got zero point energy. And some people might say cosmic microwave background radiation and ordinary fields behave in this way as well. And this is precisely why you can have positive mass always and never negative, because it cannot be zero. You can't change sign. If, if it's continuous, it can't, it can't go through a zero position. It wouldn't be continuous if it did. So there's no zero, no crossover, no, 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 no other axes, nothing like that. However, we always have always known charge was discrete and delivered in, in chunks, precise units. I'm not talking about the values of charge, that's really energy. I'm talking about the, the, the charge units. So let's go back to space and time for a moment. Why are they fundamentally different? And a bit of philosophy here, and not just mathematically, they're completely different quantities then time is not part of space, it's something else. Well, time is continuous and space isn't. And this, it's the space one that caused me most trouble and I'll explain why. Time's continuity has many consequences. It means that time is irreversible. So, because if we wanted to reverse time, we'd have to create a zero. We'd have to have a stopping point and come back on itself. It would no longer be continuous. Time is irreversible precisely for that nor is time an observable in quantum mechanics. We never actually write time as an observable. Space is an observable, but time is not. And when we do differential equations, we always make it what we call the independent variable. We never write dt over dx, we write dx over dt. Time is the thing that runs on its own, and the thing that we observe is the space. We can't do it the other way around. And this is a favorite old one. This is Zeno's paradox of the Achilles and the tortoise. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but I'll just run through it quickly. Uh, the tortoise gives, but well, Achilles gives, is 10 times faster than the tortoise. He gives the tortoise 100 meters start. So he starts running the 100 meters and the tortoise goes 10 meters while Achilles goes 100 meters. And then Achilles has to catch him up there, so he runs the, the, the 10 meters and the tortoise goes one meter. So Achilles has to run the one meter and the tortoise goes a tenth of a meter, and so on, and he never catches up. And the various philosophers have talked about this, um, the, or, or also science writers, Whitra, I think, is a philosopher, I met him once. Um, you conclude that the idea of infinite divisible of time must be rejected or one must recognize there's logical fiction. 
Motion is impossible if time and correlated space is divisible out of infinitum. And Coveney and Highfield science writers say either one can seek to deny the notion of becoming, in which case time assumes its essentially space-like properties, or must reject the assumption that time like space is infinitely divisible into ever smaller portions. N neither author and most other people don't actually say that the real that you've got to opt for time being uh, continuous. But there is a reversibility paradox, another paradox, a more recent one. Aren't all normal physical equations time reversible? So they are. And the reason why that is, is because we know uh, we, time is not reversible. We know that from the second law of thermodynamics. And as Eddington said, you can uh, violate any law of physics you want, but if you violate the second law of thermodynamics, the only thing is to put a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the sea. It's, a, it's completely inviolable. You cannot violate the second law of thermodynamics. And we know that time, that means time isn't reversible. We know that if we make a film of us dropping a cup of tea and smashing the cup, that, that we know which way round is forward and which back, and we always do. But physical equations are time reversible mathematically. And that's because time is an imaginary parameter. So it's got equal positive and negative solutions. But physical actions involve time squared. So it doesn't really matter whether it's plus or minus. You can reverse time symmetry, but you can't reverse time because you can change plus and minus. Time itself, the continuum can't be reversed. There's no paradox whatsoever. Now, this is the one that caused me total most problem. After the charges, this caused me the most problem. Space has to be discrete. And of course it's got to be discrete, because how can we observe it? But its discreteness isn't fixed. That's the whole point. It's different from that of charge because it's a non-conserved quantity. So it doesn't have fixed units. It means that its discreteness must be endlessly reconstructed, which allows us to do fractals. It's infinitely divisible. And we can keep divining it and we can keep recalibrating it any way we want. It's the absolute continuity of time which makes it impossible to divide time. And infinite divisibility and is the absolute opposite of continuity. They're not the same thing at all. They're completely opposite. So this is where I had to find some mathematics I didn't know existed. Space is represented mathematically as a real number line. That's a common way of representing space. But real numbers are not necessarily absolutely continuous because there are two systems of algebra, two of geometry and two of calculus. And these depend on two different equally valid definitions of the real numbers. These are called standard and non-standard analysis. Standards, the one we have Cantor sets and all that kind of thing. Non-standard is more recent, 1920s, Skolem Lovenheim theorem and Abraham Robinson produced standard analysis. Interestingly, standard analysis, uh, non-standard analysis, sorry, uh, frequently uses a nilpotent structure. Different from mine, but still a nilpotent structure. And for calculus, there were two ways of differentiating known from the beginning. And these really, these really come down to the differentiation of, with respect to time or space, the two, the two variable quantities. Only the time one actually solves Zeno. It's been used to say limits solve Zeno. Well, it does, but that's because it's time. The other one is infinitesimals. And now infinitesimals have been re resurrected as a result of non-standard analysis. So it's like the, the, the argument about mathematics. Is it out, out there or is it something we construct? Well, it's either. If it's out there, then the real numbers can't be counted, Cantor's argument. If we have to construct it, then they're countable, leading to non-standard analysis. And the same duality in mathematics applies in physics. We combine space and time in a four vector, but we're doing something that we physically cannot do. 
So we've got to make space time-like, which is the discrete solution, or we make space, sorry, time-space-like, which is the discrete solution, or space time-like, which is the continuous. And this is where wave particle duality comes from, and also the, the dis distinction between Heisenberg and Schrodinger's version of quantum mechanics. And this is a key point here. Discrete quantities are always three-dimensional. Continuous quantities are non-dimensional, or if you like, you can call it one-dimensional, but there, there isn't any uh, dimensionality, really. So why are continuous quantities dimensional, non-dimensional? Well, we can see that because you can't have an origin. So you can't have a zero, you can't have a crossover point. That would be incompatible with continuity. That's no problem. So, but why are discrete quantities three-dimensional? Well, if we look at a quantity with only 1D, we couldn't measure it because the crossover point to another dimensions are needed to do, do it, do the scaling. So a line isn't a one-dimensional structure, but a one-dimensional structure that can exist in a two-dimensional world, and even a two-dimensional world doesn't really is. You have to have a three-dimensional world to draw a line. To actually draw it, you've got to have thickness on the page and things like that. But there's a much more direct argument and this takes us to the deepest foundations of both mathematics and physics. And this difficult to explain connection between discreteness and three-dimensionality turns out to be the key to the whole problem of getting something from nothing. This, is, this isn't something I can talk about now. This is something else I can talk about in a future date, the, the universal rewrite structure. But I, I, if I only have four parameters and the, the two that are three-dimensional are also discrete, then it follows that discreteness in nature comes from anti-commutativity and not from anything else. Ultimately, the real reason is anti-commutativity allows us to have a dual pairing between I and J and J and I, whose total is zero. And totality zero is something I have always sought in nature. So nature generates something from nothing by producing an infinite or closed, a set of closed quaternion triplets like I, J, K, and these can represent discrete numbers or objects. And that's the rewrite structure. This is my book on zero to infinity. That's the uh, full significances in the first chapter of that. And this is the other key text, Foundations of Physical Law. Both are published by World Scientific. This is based on 10 lectures at the University of Liverpool, which are available, video, slides, text, and the various sites. And I've just put one down there for when I send the slides out. Now, putting everything together, from those all that argument let's put everything together and everything goes together in this table see the two non-conserved two conserved two real two imaginary and they and they're different they're different pairing and then we get two continuous or commutative dimensional if you like and two that are discrete or three-dimensional and anti-commutative and when we look at this this strikes us straight away it's perfectly symmetrical and this is a symmetry I found many decades ago, and I still haven't found anything that breaks it, as we will see. So this symmetry is a group of order four. It's called a Klein four group. It's the group of the rotations of the rectangle, D2. It's a very simple group, and it's almost the simplest group except the cyclic groups below it, C2 and C3. And you can write it, you can use algebraic symbols to express it simply. If I just put algebraic symbols for what I call the properties and the anti-properties. And if you add it all up, it's a conceptual zero, which is what I'm, I've always aimed at. I do not want anything in nature to be characterized. It must always add up to zero. And also you notice the, uh, the four parameter structure is like one, per, one parameter and three sign variations. It's just like the Dirac um, nilpotent wave function. You've got only got one value that's independent. The others follow automatically, like the general. I got the first medal by accident, and the rest followed automatically. So we can assume that this Klein-4 group is absolutely true globally. That's when you treat the parameters as separate from each other. And no exception, I'm going to say, I'm going to stand by that, has ever been found. And this condition can be used to put constraints on physics to derive laws and states of matter. 
And I have done exactly that. So we can get some nice representations of this, which not only shows the absoluteness of the symmetry, but the idea of three dimensionality being central to the argument. And here I say again, the perfect symmetry between four parameters means that only the properties of one parameter need to be assumed. The rest follow like kaleidoscopic images. And it is in fact arbitrary in principle, which we start with. I used to start with space, sometimes I start with mass. And it also suggests that three dimensionality is key to this symmetry. Now this is one, this is what I call the color representation. By great good luck, our three color system also matches the three um, properties. And I can make, I can use either of these circles. I could make the left, let's look at the left hand one. I could make the central circle, um, whatever you like, let's call it mass. And if I take the, the red at the bottom to be mean real, and if I take the blue to be conserved um, and the green to be dimensional or non-dimensional as, as it happens. So it's non-dimensional for mass. So green is non-dimensional. Blue is um, it's conserved and red is imaginary. Is, sorry, red is real. Real, conserved and non-dimensional. So if I look at the next circle surrounding it, I've now got magenta where there was green. So that property is going to swap over and th that's going to become um, dimensional. Uh, the blue is still there. So that's uh, conserved, dimensional conserved. And the cyan below the red means it's imaginary. So that's clearly charge with those properties. And I can do it for the others. But I could swap them all around. I could change the colors. I could change anything. I could change it to the other diagram using the secondary colors and then the, uh, bringing the prime primary afterwards. So that's the color representation. Sum them all up, you get zero white. This is another representation, the 3D representation. You put, draw a line from the center of a cube. Let's, it's easier to see this way. And the red lines there are the could be the parameters using those X, Y, Z things. Interestingly, the cyan ones um, suggest there's a dual group and there is a dual group. The dual group is what happens if you switch one of the pro properties around. For example, you can switch the real and imaginary properties around and what you get then. Well, what I notice you get then is the properties as they, the parameters as they appear in the Dirac equation, not the pure global ones. And this is another favorite, the tetrahedral. And you can use either vertices or faces to represent the um, parameters. And you can see the three green, blue, and red going into the, into the top one. And that those are the three properties going in. And the colors and, and uh, the primary and secondary colors are the properties and anti-properties. I'm just going to list a few consequences that we have of this group. Conservation laws of map. These are, these are the things we've had a look at. Notice these are obvious consequences, immediate consequences. And they're only on the symmetry. There's no physics gone into this. As such, it's just purely symmetry of this group. And there's a lot more besides. So I just put some of them down. So another thing you can do when you look at the premises and the properties is that they're purely abstract. In fact, they can be reduced to pure algebra. Real and imaginary is clearly just algebra. Commutative and anti-commutative is obviously just algebra. The conserved and non-conserved is not so obvious, but I believe that it is just algebra. And I believe what that is, is that the conserved property have closed quaternion units and the non-conserved have imaginary numbers that are not quaternions, which are um, in Clifford algebra, they become partial um, quaternions, they're un unclosed quaternions. So this, there's something incomplete about them. And we could actually start with the algebra to define the three properties we've had. So this is the algebra now representing the properties. And mass is a scalar, time is a pseudo scalar, complex numbers, imaginary numbers, charges a quaternion and space is a vector. 
And what you may notice is that the first three are simply subalgebras of the last. And if we combine them together, we would get another space-like quantity. And we could write it as the red RJK bold vector. So they're equivalent to another vector space, what I call an anti-space, if we want totality zero. And to counter the real space, IJK blue. So we can see why space appears to have a privileged status. It's got more structure than all the others. And that's why that it's useful for observation and the others aren't. And the other space isn't observable because it's not a single quantity. It's a mixture of two or three. So the, all the parameters are equivalent in the group, but they actually produce a mathematical hierarchy, like a kind of evolutionary structure. And I've gone into that in the rewrite structure. We can de derive it from a more gentle, uh, general information process. And I think it operates in mathematics, computer science, chemistry, and biology, as well in more complex aspects of physics, not just in fundamentals. We can actually derive some of that complexity directly. Okay, that's the global situation. What happens when we put it all together into one object, if you like? We package the physical information and we combine all this algebra, all this four parameters together. Well, if we, if we combine all that algebra together, what we get are 64 units, which I'll show you in a moment. And these turn out to be the algebra of the Dirac equation. And this equation is that of the minimum packaged unit in physics, the Fermi elementary particle. And it, I didn't work this algebra out as anything to do with the Dirac equation, but it, it came afterwards to me that, I, that it really was the Dirac algebra. And so that was a big, another big breakthrough for me. But these are the 64 units. Um, complex numbers times vectors, complex numbers times quaternion, complex numbers times vectors and quaternions. However, this group only requires five generators. So the minimum information is five units. And there are many ways of selecting these, but all of these sets have the same overall structure. I mean, you can do it without using that structure, but then you don't get all the parameters in it. This is, one way of doing it that there are plus and minus versions of this There's 32 on this page but there's plus there's minus versions as well as plus these form another group a group of order 64 and a simplest starting point for any group could be the generators the, the set of elements which are sufficient to generate it by multiplication the minimum description of the group and i've picked out five on there marked with an asterisk However, this is another way of setting out the same information. And here I've got the negative ones as well as the positive. And if you look, you can see that the, the table, if you forget the first line, which is just complex numbers, the second line, uh, and you've got positive on one side and negative on the other. Let's just look at the positive. We got five objects there. And if you look at the five objects, they've got all the single components based on the algebra of space, time, mass, and charge, but they're arranged in, um, in that structure. What I want you to look at in particular is all the, all the these are called pentads, and, the, and there are 12 of these, and they just repeat themselves. You can fiddle around with the vectors and quaternions, plus and minus, imaginary and non-imaginary, but it doesn't really matter. They all come out the same. And any of those five can be used as the generators of this group, at least if you, if you complexify in some cases. Now, if you look at the top line, you can see there that the three blue units, I, J, K, of space are attached to one quaternion, red I. But you notice that the other two quaternions are attached to other things. K is attached to a complex I and the J is attached to a unit one. So that's going to change the whole nature of these things by bundling them together. And this is what this compactification is what I believe creates locality. 
So we start with eight basic units, but by the time we've worked out all the possible combination, we get 64. The most efficient way is to get five composites rather than eight primitives. Nature will always go for the most efficient or the simplest or the least of anything. If we take the properties of the parameters independently of each other, they're global. But if we combine them and produce compactified representation, we change the local conditions. So this is what we've done here. We've effectively, to get those, that particular um, arrangement of five, we've taken the i, j, k of charge and put each of those onto different parameters. Okay, and, we, you, and whatever you do, you're gonna break the symmetry of one of the three dimensional quantities because the red ones no longer have rotation symmetry. They're not attached to the same sort of object, whereas the blue ones retain theirs. And what I'm saying is this creates the new compound and quantized physical quantities. Quantized because you've got quantized units doing it, the charge units. You've got energy um, is IK and I, 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 J, I and K, I are momentum and mass is I, J. That's not mass as we had it in the past. That is now rest mass, discrete mass. And those... The E and PX and PY and all that are just scalar values. They're just coefficients. The real physics is in the operators in the middle of the page. That's what tells you it's an energy term or a momentum term or a mass term. And as we've seen on other occasions, well, to some people have, the combined object is nil potent squaring to zero. So if I put the whole thing in a, in a bracket, and multiply by itself, I get zero because, we, because the squared product gives us Einstein's energy equation. E squared minus P squared minus M squared equals zero. And what the Dirac equation does is quantize the nil potent equation. It, it uses, it, it replaces the E and P in the first bracket with differentials in space and time. However, we don't actually need to do that. We can treat the first, um, the first bracket as operators and we can still write E and P then. And the second bracket as the thing, as the amplitude term. And what we're doing together is bundling everything together in a local system. A local system is gonna be relativistic and it's going to be quantum. So we can take the first bracket as an operator acting, this is to get quantum mechanics on the phase factor, the EMP terms, and the EMP terms can include any number of potentials or interactions with other particles. It's just a ge generic thing to write E and P, completely generic. It, it's not a scalar value, it's a generic um, operator. But if we take the um, bracket as an amplitude for a particle, then we've got the Pauli exclusion principle because it means two particles can't be the same or their combination would zero. And if we look at the broken symmetry between the three, the three red objects, we see that we've got a broken symmetry between the charges. And, and these charges are now adopt the characteristics, the mathematical objects they're connected to. So the first one is connected to a pseudo scalar and it, it takes up SU2 symmetry. The second one to a vector and it gets SU3 symmetry and the third one into a scalar, so that retains U1 symmetry. And you can actually do this, go through the, the full technical mathematics of this um, and develop those um, groups, SU2, SU3, and U1 for this structure. Now, if I look at Pauli exclusion, another way of looking at that is to say nature represents a totality of zero, and if you imagine creating a particle with everything it's got in it, potentials, connections, and all that, in that form, then the rest of the universe has to be the opposite. It has to be the negative of that. So we get a total of zero. And it also has to be multiplied to zero as well. So we have to do global and local additions. Because basically, locality is all about multiplication and globality is about addition in principle. The whole left by creating the particle from nothing is what we call, which is the rest of the universe. Once you've, once you've took the particle out of nothing, you're left with the rest of the universe. 
And that's the universe that's needed to maintain the particle in that state. You give it the name vacuum. So the vacuum for one particle cannot be the vacuum for any other. Now let's just have a little bit of entertainment here. A lot of people think that you've got a 10 dimensional system. Well, you can have it from this if you really want, because each nil potent's got three um, red terms and five red terms and five others. So you've got energy, three components of momentum and rest mass. You've got weak charge, three components of strong charge and electric charge. And all but six of those are fixed. And the string theorists like to say that they're curled up. And the first group can also have time, three dimensional space and proper time instead of, I won't bother about talking about membranes. So I think we've now reached a position where we can show that the structure of physics is symmetry between space, time, mass, and charge. Package, packaging these into a single structure as a fundamental particle creates quantum mechanics and relativity and breaks the symmetry between three units of charge. And it also maintains zero totality. And I uh, asked my biological colleague to make a better drawing of uh, the diagram I drew, and this is what it looked like. And you can see that's the drawing. Right. So have we got a Rosetta Stone? Well, if it's true, and I think it's been tested to destruction in both global and local forms, we may have our Rosetta Stone. If we want to take it to the next level of application, we assume that the symmetry is absolute, unbreakable and exclusive, and that there's no other information. And then you've got a powerful constraint on all possible theories. And uh, I've done that, and you can see it in my book, Zero to Infinity and the Foundations of Physical Law. And thank you very much for listening. Wow, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I, I suppose, um, just sort of thinking about opening up for questions, um, and I'm conscious that um, uh, Stop this, uh, yeah. this particular, obviously this particular group, we're exploring the connection between particularly physics and biology. And one of the key figures um, between physics and biology, um, and particularly the biology of John Torday, is David Bohm. So I, I just wonder, I mean, I suppose, I've, I've got a question maybe to start off the questions, and I, I think I'm gonna ask John Williamson this. What, what would David Bohm make of what Peter's just said? How, would it, how does this translate to the implicate order? Bohm would have been completely fascinated. He'd been one of us on this. Mm. I think Bohm was a free thinker, a proper free thinker as Peter is. Whether he would have agreed entirely with uh, Peter's analysis above and beyond uh, where Bohm was, I, well, I would have to ask Bohm to answer for that. Mm. And, um, and Bohm's group still exists, of course, so we could invite, um, we, we could invite some of those people to come along and, and talk and think about that too. But as to what Bohm would or would not have thought, um, I can't comment, but I know what I think about it. Mm. And, and uh, I love it. I, I love Peter's analysis. I love the fact that he is looking at three dimensions there, that he's getting parts of three dimensions out of this. That he's looking at the, at the ordering and the kind of orderings that are required. He and I are both aware of the seven dimensional things there and how they get, how they get messy when you come to that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of system. He's looking at the relative, imp uh, the relative ordering between space and time. Again, something I think would have fascinated Bohm. Yeah. So um, if that answers the question, um, and I'm not sure it does, then uh, because Really, the answer is I wouldn't know what somebody with Bohm's mind would think of something like this, but uh, I would have loved to have heard it. Yeah. But I think he would have been listening as well as on this and, uh, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it as much as I did. On, yeah. on this one. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I always find I'm going to have to watch the video again, Peter. Um, yeah, well, that's, I hope everybody does. That's, that's, the whole point of, that's the whole point of videoing these things, that we can watch them again. Um, but can, can, can I say, Yeah. Sorry, John, you were going to say something. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I didn't want to drop your train of thought there. Was there something you wanted to say further? I was going to ask about videos and what we should do about them because um, we, we have different groupings at the moment and uh, I've been putting some of my videos up on Quicycle. They're not really up on Quicycle. They're really up on YouTube and then linked to Quicycle. Yeah. You, YouTube there, there is a place. 
Rootube is a place. Can we put this up on YouTube as well, Peter's video, and then link to it multiply? Yeah. And we also link to each other. Absolutely. Let's build, let's build a network. Let's expand this whole thing out to the whole of science yeah. between us. So, so the other... Sorry, John, just yeah. to say the other thing that we've been doing is we've been, we, we've had an open uh, Google Doc where uh, John Torday and me and a few other people have been exchanging thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's been a very useful thing. Um, and it's, it's sort of a, a record of an ongoing conversation, really. Um, we've, been, we've been doing the same amongst a few of us as well and putting Google Docs up too. Yeah on different things but i'm just thinking you know if peter or i or other people want to give talks we don't want to give them six times no, different no, groups no, no. <laughs> we want to no. make sure that uh, there's some efficiency here in terms of in terms of what we're doing yeah and uh, and, and 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 we also have such things as ampa and roger's recording yeah. of ampa and things like that let, let, yeah. let's interlink all of these things because that's a what, what Peter just gave was overlapping to some of the stuff that he gave in Quisicle. It was, a, it was a, an exposition which I think is more accessible, but I'd love to see that being accessible to other people as well and other, and other conversations like this going in all directions, if that would be possible. Absolutely. This is like a prequel to the... This is like a yeah. prequel. Yeah, this is, this is like Star Wars episode. <laughs> 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 Very good. Okay, can I can I ask can I ask uh, John Torday to um um if you've got any questions and uh, thoughts about what Peter's just said um the presentation. Well, as as I was mulling over what the way that I would think about what Peter just said, if I could possibly get my head around it, I try. I think of the conversation between Bohm and Krishnamurti in 1983, Krishnamurti telling Bohm that in order to really understand the cosmos, it's a blink, it's, it's a total leap of faith, if you will. And Bohm is totally nonplussed by that, which I found puzzling. I mean, what Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti is telling Bohm is that thinking is what gets in the way of understanding everything. So he's, he's advocating for like meditation to get from this level up to the level that he wants to be at. Whereas in uh, wholeness and the implicate order, what I could derive from that was that Bohm was very heavy on the empiric approach, which is where I come from. So how empiricism allows us to transcend our subjective egos, uh, strip that away, and in my opinion, uh, consciousness with a lowercase c and consciousness with an uppercase c are really one and the same thing. And I say that because physiology or the evolution of physiology is a stepwise systematic way in which our physiology complies with the laws of nature in the same way that everything else does. So we're all one of a piece. So my point is that I think that what Peter is telling me is that the mathematics is consistent with what I'm saying about the evolutionary um, principle. Um, and so I would suggest, I think I actually said, in a, we, we had a seminar going at UCLA before I, I left, sort of ha having these big th thoughts and, and uh, Eric Sherry, who's an ex expert in the periodic table was lecturing and somehow we got on the subject of Bohm and I don't know, I said, I said something about to this effect and, and I got a lot of blowback from that. People did not agree with me. But I think what I'm trying to say is that there is that Bohm's way of thinking is consistent with what I'm saying, is consistent with what Peter is saying, but that you have to really understand the holistic way of thinking in order to gain that kind of perspective. If that makes any sense. I, I, I think it does. I and I think that a holistic way of looking at things, I think one has to look at things in the, it, the same thing in different ways. I won't say at the same time, because, I'm also, because what I'm about to say is by removing time. Yes. By having a look at something which is... Absolutely. So in my, I'm, I'm really winging it here because you haven't, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to go through the reasoning with you, but basically 20 plus years ago now, um, I came to the realization as a lung biologist that I had all of the components to be able to, 
through the cellular communication principles of embryology applied to phylogeny as speciation to actually merge those two pr properties together as, a, as one continuous process. Mm -hmm. And then by reversing, by looking backwards in space and time at the process of um, uh, both embryology and phylogeny, which you need, you need all that data, including pathophysiology, because there are places where things seemingly, there are, there are gaps. So the gaps get filled in by the people doing work on pathology, for example, which I, I have done in my career. Um, but my point is that I was able to ultimately work my way all the way back to the unicellular state um, through the same, uh, what Gould called exaptations. Or, so the emergent property of, of evolution really is due to the fact that, that the, the biology is re, uh, uh, reutilizing genes that have been useful in, in its prior history for some existential confrontation that it's ha having. That's evolution. I think that's a very interesting thing. I, I've been lucky enough to uh, meet with some very interesting people while I've been here in, uh, in Poznan who uh, I'm interested in the quantum mechanics, the way that evolution and the quantum mechanics of evolution is something which I think is synergistic in terms of the way that, that genes um, evolve locally in, in terms of a genetic system. And perhaps that's something that in this group will be something that could be talked about as well further. So I've published a paper on the quantum mechanics of evolution, but what I'd I- love that reference because I'd love to pass it on to the people I'm talking to here because I started talking to them about this and, and, uh, and um, we discovered papers in very diverse fields. I discovered papers that are in very diverse fields that were talking about this, but they weren't aware of in the genetics field they were looking at this was something that was important. Well, particularly and, because I do, we do epigenetics in my laboratory at UCLA. So epigenetics is everything except for the DNA code. Fantastic. I'd love to see that. Yeah. So, so briefly, uh, I'm a laid claim to the idea that the atom and the cell are homologues. They both evolved from, I mean, Peter doesn't like hanging his, I mean, you know, sort of staking that claim of, you know, the Big Bang. But whatever that cataclysm was, the asymmetries were generated. And so, um, so the best example I have is Pauli exclusion principle is four variables for electron spin. The first three are deterministic. The fourth one is probabilistic. I've suggested that there are three uh, first principles of physiology. There's negative entropy, which comes from Schrodinger, what is life? Yeah. Chemiosmosis, which is the, the most the simplest form of bioenergetics to sustain a negative entropic state. And the third is probably the most important and that's homeostasis. And in my opinion, what homeostasis actually is, is the equal and opposite reaction to the big bang, you know, Newton's third law of motion. So homeostasis is the equal sign in any given balanced equation. Physics e equals MC squared, chemistry, sodium plus chlorine equals sodium chloride, and biology, which is actually pseudo you know it's it's a derivative of all that it's not it's not a one-to-one -one relationship it's it's a it's a mimicry mimicking of the physics but here you have endoderm plus mesoderm plus ectoderm equals uh, you know offspring but the more important point i'm trying to make is that if in fact what i'm saying and and i've accounted for like non-localization and coherence et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. so they're all there are is key. sorry I, I think coherence is a key word there and I don't think you need a big bang to give you the direction because what Peter's just been talking about as well has given you an asymmetry as well, a direction in terms of the difference between space and time. Um, at, at least if that's forming a resonance with the way that I think about it, Peter. So what do, what, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, well, I prefer not to pin my colors to that particular mass, the big bang theory. Um, Me neither. In fact, um, no way. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, but, but, I'm, I'm trying to find general principles and there is an asymmetry and a direction. Yeah. You, you don't actually need it to start in some, um, in some peculiar way. Uh, exactly. I agree completely with that. And uh, it, what I'm trying to do is saying the trouble with the Big Bang Theory isn't, isn't just the problems that it has, but it's the idea that that's the explanation. It's a sort of archaeology rather than physics. That's the explanation. There's not any fundamental principles explaining it. Yeah. Yeah. So if, even if there was a Big Bang, you need to have fundamental principles which will explain it. And they don't bother with that. They just say, 
this came before that, it came before that. And it's like, you know, the, the Romans came after the Greeks who came after the Egyptians. Yeah, turtles all the way down. Or it's, or it could be just soul story. I mean, the, the way it's done is as archaeology. I not there's anything wrong with archaeology in the archaeological context, but it's not relevant to physics. Peter, while I've got you in public, there's a talk I would really like to see you giving, and that's that that, that that's uh, that's the one on exactly that, mm. on, on 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 the principle on on the general principle of the nature of the universe in terms of in in, in terms of a zero energy system. Now I've seen a talk of yours on that recently. And I'm not sure whether you'd like to see, have that post in public. I thought it was yeah. pretty damn good to I, say that. I'm, I'm completely happy to have any of my talks posted anywhere. Brilliant. But um, if, if you, okay, good. Well, uh, we can talk about that one and put it up either here or there. Um, or you could give another one if you wanted to update it. But if, it's, uh, if you're happy having it out there, I can arrange for it to appear on Cry Bicycle. I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, just sure. Like, but what I didn't say was everything that I've just said about my work is founded on experimental evidence. It's not, so I don't do systems biology. Systems biology is just associations and correlations. It's nice diagrams, but it doesn't explain causation. It doesn't explain the ontology, which I think I've identified through the approach that I've taken. Mm -hmm. But in saying so, the question in my mind is, if there was a singularity, um, I think that the unicellular state is actually a mimicking of the, the, the singularity. And the re reason I say that is because the cytoskeleton of the unicellular state actually accounts for um, all of the states that the cell can be in, whether it's homeostatic or mitotic or meiotic. So there is a, a form that we can uh, identify, which I, I personally think would be interesting to query to try and you know, do a bioassay of what the singularity was. And the reason I think that it's correct is because I hadn't realized until not that long ago that when cells divide, when an, amoeba, when an amoeba divides, it doesn't divide symmetrically. It also explains, for example, why identical twins are not identical. We know that now. So where does that as asymmetry come from and what's governing that? Is it purely mass action or is there some underlying set of principles that dictate which genes go to which of the, you know, the daughter cells, for example? And that that's, you know, that's kind of the, the, the secret in the sauce, if you will, in terms of, <laughs> Um, in my opinion, of um, the heterogeneity of, 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 um, of the biology and, and may be um, in service to the underlying physics. It probably is. The quest and in my mind, when I listen to Peter, I think to myself, is there a way in which you can show, uh, you can um, show the, the underpinnings of the, the, of the biology by the, by the physics? And I think you can. Yeah. I think it is feasible. Um, and anybody got any questions? I, I have a, I have a sort of probably a stupid question, um, Peter, and and John. Do you want to get John? Yeah, I, yeah, I've, I've got a, I've got a question here, Peter. And um, so we, we talked about ten and eleven dimensionality, and we talked about the sort of starting dimensionalities of the of, of the quaternion quaternionic systems that you put in there. If you had to pin your mass to a number of the dimensionality of the stuff that you're putting in here, uh, what would that be? Well, yeah, I think it's uh, three, but multiplied. It's three, is that six or nine? No, it's, no, it's not nine. You can do it, it's not nine. It's, the, 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 I don't think there is any other dimensionality other than three. I think all the others are not really truly dimensions. When people say, yeah. yes, yes, I'm with you. Yes. Okay, good man. Right, good. Okay. So there's 10 dimensions, but they're not dimensions. Oh, no, 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 they're not really dimensions. Exactly. I have 16 in mind, but most yeah. of them are not dimensions. I have written a paper on how many dimensions are there. So you might want to read All right, that. I should read that then, shouldn't I? Okay, yeah. good. Um, right. Good answer, though. That's my favorite answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think three is a special number. Yeah, I agree. And and I just, you know, one, one thing that, I, that Peter and I, I think, agreed on the last Zoom we had was, I mean, I, I can account for the nil potency of uh, biology because if the, the mechanism of epigenetic inheritance actually indicates that the actual state of primary level of selection is not Darwinian adults being selected for their reproductive prowess and the number of offspring, 
that's purely, that's bean counting. That's not what it's all about. The reality is that it is the unicellular state that is the primary level of selection. So in, in, uh, in um, epigenetic inheritance, as we have shown and others have shown uh, experimentally, it's the acquisition of these epigenetic uh, so-called marks, um, information in the environment that indicates the, the spe specific changes in the environment that the organism or its offspring have to cope with when they emerge through the reproductive process. So it's the egg and the sperm that actually are pr processing this new information biochemically, and then it gets uh, in, uh, assimilated in the zygote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But my point is that we actually, I don't, I think like the Red Queen in Alice, we are actually all about equipoise. It's not, biology is not complex. We make it complex because we, th we think so highly of ourselves. So I think that once you be begin to realize, and I, I said to Mark in, in a recent email, that even when you think about, when I think about the embryologic steps, so you go from the zygote to, you know, two, four, 16, you know, 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, stages, at every one of those junctures, you're at a nil point um, in the sense that phylogenetically, it represents some species in the speciation process. So what I'm saying is that the nil point actually is alive and well in biology as well as in physics. So everything does, uh, add up to zero. And what we're doing in thinking in Darwinian terms is we're really constrained, we're, we're making ourselves, we're blinding ourselves to the actual underlying mechanism of evolution. Mm. Uh, Peter, can I ask you, because um, every time I listen to your presentations, I understand a little bit more, and then I a little, understand a little bit more about something I don't understand. Um, Compactification. Can you just explain your compactification? Is that factorizing? It's bundling everything together in in one structure. So you you put all the algebra into one structure, and what do you get? You get this. It. I mean, I think it's like mathematics. You've got addition, and you've got multiplication. If you got multiplication two two times three. Is like every bit of the two coupling with every bit of the three. Whereas if you've got addition, it's just the whole thing and the whole thing. And it's, and it's like every bit of the structure coupling with every other bit of the structure. That's what I mean by compactification. But you go from eight and you get five out of the eight different elements. But you get five out of the eight because those five uh, generate... The, when you've got eight, that's not the full thing. If yeah. I write down three vectors, i, j, k, yeah. and if I multiplied those i, j, k out, I would get the co complexified vectors as well. We call them yeah. pseudo vectors. Yeah. Um, things like angular momentum and so on would come out. Area, mm. that's a pseudo vector. And if I multiplied again, I'd get a pseudo scalar like volume, which is a, a, just a complex number. So mm. if I were to write the full algebra of vectors down, it wouldn't be just three units it would be i think is it 16 we give you count plus and minus 16 units mm. because you've got to have um vectors you've got to have pseudo vectors there's three and three that's six and you've got to have pseudo scalar seven and scalars eight and you multiply them by two because you've got plus and minus so there are 16 units to vector algebra mm. and there are eight units to quaternion algebra but you, but you usually only write down the three that you need to generate the rest. Okay. So what I'm saying is, if you're to find out what the whole picture is of all the possible connections between all these um, units, these eight units, mm. you would find 64 units, which is in that big table. Mm -hmm. And that is the group of order 64. Now, what's the simplest structure you can use to generate all of the units? And it isn't the eight, and it isn't six, it's five. Right. So you can, you can pick five out of the 64 that will generate all the units. Yeah. And you can do that in multiple ways. But it's got to be five, and there's no, there's no simpler way doing it. You can't do it from four or three. It's yeah. got to be five to generate all the, all the possible combinations and connections that you get. Yeah. As I say, when we're doing... Uh, vectors we have to remember that we've got areas and volumes and other things as well mm. and 
So the five is interesting, isn't it? Because it's obviously, I mean, you, I, I know in your work in the biological work, you've gone into Fibonacci and, and all of that um, kind of. Well, the five is key. I mean, five is connected with Fibonacci, the root five in the, in the, uh, the golden section. And five is key because it's the first stage of which you break symmetry in mathematics or in nature. Five is never pure symmetry. It's Once you get five, it's a broken symmetry. Intuitively, I would say that that is a representative of, of asymmetry. It's counterintuitive. It is. It's got to be asymmetric and it's got to be five. Yeah. And in the biological work I've done, I get fives all over the place. So does that speak to the ambiguity of our origins? I don't know her, about our origins from the point of view of where the universe came from kind of thing. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I think of creation as now, now, now. Every, everything is a, a new creation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, increases the, everything increases the entropy. And the, the re rewrite structure I have, that, that increases the entropy um, all the time. It's just, just the order at which the, the, the number of connections you make. And biological things are more entropic because they make more um, connections than, than other things. They're, they're more complicated. If you've got a more complicated system, you've got bigger entropy. But so if, I mean, if the, if the purpose of, if they're, of, of what we're trying to do is to find that interface between what you're talking about and what I'm talking about. Well, I don't have a problem with it because you, you've got, I mean, you've got a cell and if you like, that cell is like the, the nilpotent structure. It's yeah. like what in that bracket, you've enclosed it in that bracket yes. and you've actually reduced it down to the minimal in, the, in that bracket that you can do and generate everything. Right. And that's in a kind of way what you're doing with a cell. Yes. No, what I, I sort of glibly said to Mark in an email um, yesterday, I, it all of a sudden I thought of, I, I was trying to think of the, home, the, the, the metaphor for how uh, lipids create boundaries inside and outside, and I, Ouroboros came to mind. So the snake catching its own tail. And then I said, but that's interesting because it's like the snake in the Garden of Eden. Is the snake creating the Garden of Eden? And what we're talking about is that knowledge generation that came out of that. But my point being that if, if in fact, that's kind of the, the common denominator from a cultural perspective, that gives me great hope that what we're talking about actually will play out in many different ways. I think it'll play out across the whole um, thing because there's always some structure which boxes itself off and excludes the rest of the, and interacts yeah. with it, but isn't, isn't it? There's the, there's the thing and there's the rest of the universe and they all obey Newton's third law and they all obey conservation of energy or, or they have a um, exchange of energy. Even if it's dissipative, you can actually write the law by which it dissipates. So there's always a, you can always apply that uh, energy, uh, energy conservation laws and you can always apply Einstein's energy conservation laws even though we don't think of these systems as being relativistic because the, 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 the structure of it is still there. I agree. I mean, I, I think I said in an earlier Zoom to Elizabeth, maybe it was to Elizabeth. I, anyway, my, I had this pet uh, bias that economics is not, supply and demand is a description. It's the synchronic way of thinking about what economics is. But in reality, it's how well we conserve free energy, which is the case for both physiology and for economics, for example. So the free energy principle, that permeates everything, right? Because if you don't have, if you don't conserve free energy, you know that it's not going to work because it's not consonant with that vectorial direction that you know the expanding universe is moving in. That principle applies at every every stage, and it always struck me as a little bit odd that Newton's third law applies to everything. But as I've said, I think the Newton's third law isn't about between two objects; it's about between an object and the rest of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it always does that. And it, it, it's amazing that, that this actually applies at all those levels, but it does. Peter, um, I, I was thinking about our discussion about reflection and inversion, and I'm now reading this book by Arthur Eddington, Fundamental Theory. Have you read this one too? Because uh, 
He's talking about this too back in 1930, the stuff that we've been discussing. Yeah, Eddington, you know, nearly got onto some good things. He, yeah. he, he got onto some good things about um, these matrices, five-fold matrices, but he didn't really know what to do with them. No, well, I've seen it, and I'm, I'm enjoying rereading this stuff at the moment. He, he was almost onto some very good things. He just went, went wayward at the end, you know, into peculiarities. But the, we had a, a man at Amper who was quite a distinguished mathematical physicist, professor at King's College London. That was uh, Clive, um, mm -hmm. I'll think of his name in a minute. Uh, and he, Cli Clive um, was an expert on Eddington as well as his own work. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a really good book on Eddington's fundamental theory and the, the work that led up to it. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent book. Um, I'd like to see that, and uh... yeah, I have a copy of it because I, I was asked to review it. Oh, good! You know, yeah. for a journal, and I reviewed it for the journal, yeah. and I gave it a very good review. And uh, good. it's very, very interesting. It's but it. he, he, he said where he he went wrong, you know, on the one one, one over one thirty six and Eight, all that. One, one over one thirty seven, and then it was a few decimals. Well, I've actually <laughs> thought he might be able to correct that. Yeah, and, well, he had uh, a go in fundamental theory. He had a go at it, and and. Uh, you know, one or two people had a go at it at Amper, but I don't know what they really came up with. Kilmister, Clive Kilmister. I know it. I know the man. Yes, okay. Have you ever met him? Have I met him? No, I haven't met him, but I've seen some of his work. Um, I've seen some of his work and I've heard of it. Heard he of it. Was, I haven't heard about that particular book. But, uh, he was a regular at Amper till he died about 10 years ago, in, okay. in his, well into his 80s. I'm sorry I only found you at Amper in the later stages because there's a lot of things that were missed um, there. He had a colleague, Ted Bastin, who's you know also died about ten years ago, and yeah. I think he and Ted used to work together quite a lot on these things. And he was, I think, uh, I think they were interested in the implicate explicate order and stuff like that. Uh -huh. they, 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 were, they were, they were, they had a particular angle though, which they were interested in a thing called. Um, what was it called? It was a set of numbers that seemed to uh, develop into something, and it was invented by a man called Frederick Parker Rhodes. And it's I called think a it combinatorial hierarchy. Combinatorial hierarchy. That's you. Thank, thanks. Thanks for that, sir Garnet. Yeah. Combinatorial hierarchy. And they they were very keen on that. But you remember them both, don't you, uh, Garnet? Do you remember them? Yeah. They, yeah. They were a great. They were a great pair, and they, and 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 they oversaw at least from my perspective they oversaw Amper very well they did and and uh, and, and Ted had, had once been a fellow of King's College so we could get dinner there and uh, walk on the green we were allowed to walk on the green if we were with him <laughs> if that's important to you <laughs> it's the only time I've ever been allowed to walk on a green in a college in Cambridge so John, I just wanted to clarify, you, you said that you've been talking to people who are geneticists interested in bone. There, I, with all hubris aside, I'm really the only one who, who has ever suggested that the important point that I'm trying to make is that the, convergent, uh, the congruence of development, embryologic development and phylogeny creates a transcendence. So you're transcending space and time. That strips out all the materialism. I mean, I spent 50 years dissecting fetuses. I mean, I was a living, but but the reality is that that's the material reflect. You know, that's only the material aspect of what basically is a series of energy transfers. And I say that because the experimental evidence provides that. So when you have one cell communicating with another, they, they do it through these soluble growth factors that we discovered in my lab when I was still a grad student. And what happens is you trigger the formation of high energy phosphates. So it's basically a, you know, a, a Russian doll kind of um, series of high energy phosphates that I think began somewhere, you know, in that voxel of whatever we're calling the cataclysm or, you know, where the asymmetries come from. And it's just moving forward in space and time and biology is just trying to keep in, uh, in sync with an ever changing environment by definition. But I think so, I think I'm with Peter on this, that, 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 the, that, that the vortex and the moving forward is really what is exactly happening right here, right now, with us guys sitting here talking to one another in Zoom on whatever it is, the 11th of uh, June 
2020. That 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 thing is is always asymmetric, right here, right now, in terms of the motion from past mm -hmm. to present, what we call past to present, and that development is is happening, and it's happening in real time right now with us. Mm. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think you require a a big bang or anything. I think that 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 that, that motion from in that direction has always and is always present, mm. underlying anything that we do in terms of in terms of that motion. I think our job as physicists is to find general principles, fundamental general principles that always work yeah. in, in whatever circumstances. That's what we're trying to do, and not not to um, not really to provide a history, but to provide general principles. Yeah. Um, can I ask about say... self-reference? Because because uh, John mentioned the Ouroboros and um, and you know you talked about the closed boundary which separates you know the inside from the outside and so on. Does that is our sense of history emergent from that process? Well, I was just going to mention. I mean, in my reduction, um, I and as a lipid lipid chemistry was kind of my stock and trade. Um, and so, long story short, uh, Conrad Bloch's explanation of why cholesterol synthesis evolved because there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere was reasoning after the fact. The reality is that cholesterol was an answer to the question, okay, now we have a lot of oxygen, which is going to kill us off. How to respond, respond to that evolutionarily? That was in reference to the lipids that we know are produced by pulsars were delivered by these snowball-like asteroids. And if you immerse lipids in water, they form micelles. They are primitive cell uh, protocells with a semi-permeable membrane. And then if you uh, think about how the sun heated those structures floating in the, you know, the primordial ocean, um, and then they cooled off at night because this, you know, the moon was up, the sun was down, lipids have the, the property of hysteresis. They have memory. That is, the, that is the actual origins of the memory, which is necessary for evolution to be effective. Because if, if, if the process always had to reinvent the wheel, you would be extinct if you had to you know, con, con, ascribe to those, that, that principle. You have to have memory in order for evolution to work. And so that's what I was gonna say in the context of what Peter was saying about it's, this uh, change is, ever, is constant. Yes, but in the biologic form, it's it's being um, accumulated, and um, it's so. I mean, you know, mayflies only live twenty four hours. So, uh, you know, uh, giant sequoias live five five thousand, ten thousand, whatever thousands of years. Why is that? And everything in between. It's because it's the strategy that's being used by any given species to uh, compute that histor the relationship between their history and what's happening in their environment. So the time scale is not immediate um, that we know of. It's, it, it's, it, it, um, it goes across the, uh, the, life, the life cycle of the organism. So. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about Lou's work, um, uh, um, which sort of derives the quaternions from a starting point of self-reference. And I'm just wondering if that's, um, you know, that's a way of saying that then begins from now. Yeah, you mentioned anticipation in the last two, and I do think that there is an anticipatory, you know, that's the Libet experiment. This guy Libet published a paper in the early 80s in which he basically d discovered that if he caused some stress, there was a time lapse of about, I don't know, a few hundred milliseconds, as if the organism already knew that there were these possibilities was anticipating change and then it was reacting. It wasn't that it was in one-to-one -one re relationship. So there's already empiric evidence for that. Yeah. yeah, right. So we're like this spider web and you know, you, all of a sudden there's a, you know, a, it's the, the web is being shaken and, and now you have to respond in a way which is consonant with your own survival in a way which is, um, you know, efficient and, and effective. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you're driving at, but I do think that's correct. I, I, th I think it's interesting because I think, um, um, obviously, in my background um, in cybernetics, self-reference plays a fundamental role. The Ouroboros is, was used as a symbol of the American Society for Cybernetics. Um, John knows about this. Um, 
And Gordon Pask, for example, he made a great play about self-reference and the importance of reference, uh, self-reference in uh, physics and um, so on. I just wa I wonder if that's, that gets us out of this puzzle of um, whether there was a beginning or whether you need a beginning or whether it's actually always a, a now, but a now which is dimensioned in some way. Pressing the button here. I think we're talking about a directed process. And what Lou was talking about as well was not was, was something that had a time step and then the next time step and then yeah. looking at the way those things. So, so, so I think it, it lies in that gap between tick and tock as Garnet was talking about <laughs> as, as, as to the direction of these things and in terms of the way that the structure, some structures that we think of as being very complex, such as the Dirac equation, arise from something which is actually really quite a lot simpler in terms of a conceptual thing that has to do with the worm eating its own tail, tick, yeah. tock, tick, back to where you are. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of something which, if anything, is self-recreating, that yeah. it has to come back to the beginning after a certain number of rotations. So for Garnet, that's four, and for me too, Garnet, that's four, to tell you the truth. That you go, that you go round something which, is, which brings you back after four changes. And I think, um, I think um, you know, the equations I'm writing around at the moment are something that bring you back to after one change, after a single change, the linear. Mm -hmm. But you could go to quadratic or fourth power equations, and I think that eventually, you know, the ultimate thing, obviously, if, 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 if something is equal to zero at the first power, then it's also equal to zero at the second power. Something could not be equal to zero at the first power, but yet could be equal to zero at the second power, which is look at, looking, at the, looking at the second differential things, which Peter was just talking about as well. But then I think you eventually stop at the fourth. And then after that, everything else is irrelevant because by the time we've gone four times around the, uh, um, uh, the tick-tock clock around the box, then you're, then, then you're always back to where you started from. Although most of what I know in terms of physics works at the level of, a, a, of two of these things. You don't need the four. Mm. But, 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 that, but, but that order, that implicate order that comes from something happening before something else, mm. that, that leads, that leads to a lot as we've been discussing recently over the last few weeks of, of the structure of the universe, without having a structure of the universe. With, with, with just, just from the thinking, like Pask did in terms of looking back mm. on systems that recreate themselves by coming back to where they start from, mm. and uh, you know, the hard carapace of things that, that, that result from uh, that, that kind of system. So it's proper it, thinking. Is it a topology? Are we talking about a topology, a spatialization of time? Yes, it's toroidal, obviously. Something's going around, around in circles and coming back to where it started from, then topologically it's a torus. Yeah. So, yes. So, I just described that lipid chemistry, but what I find interesting is, so lipids are um, Twitter ions. They have a positive and negative charge on either end. And so when they're immersed in water, so this is the surface of the water, they will align like this and they'll pack and then they'll form these micelles. So there is an orientation that's related to the electrochemistry of that molecule. Right. It's the direction. More, yeah, yeah, right. But more importantly, uh, because um, Rich Heiberger, who's one of the participants here, and I are trying to take what I talked about and make it more intelligible to a ninth grader. Anyway, so Richard asked me, well, well why, why did calcium become the lingua franca, bad pun, of biology? You know. Um, and, uh, put some glucose in water and a paramecium will gravitate to it and uh, you'll see a calcium burst as it's doing so. And if you inhibit that calcium flux, it won't do, do that. You put a, a drip of cl uh, glucose on my tongue and I'm in an MRI, you see the same thing happening in my brain, hopefully, in my brain did. But my point is that, how did, so Rich said, well, how, do, how does that happen? And I said, well, I mean, we know that calcium uh, ions were becoming more and more uh, prevalent in the, these prim the primordial ocean because plants, algae are producing carbon dioxide, you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, you get carbonic acid that leaches calcium and other ions from the seabed. Yeah. Yeah. Calcium, point, calcium I mean, is magnesium. Yeah, well, but calcium is, well, maybe, you know, magnesium may be used by other species. I don't recall. It probably is something that uses yeah, magnesium. It's the tick and the top. Of the, of yeah, the right. Yeah. But the, the TikTok evolved in, in my way of thinking is you had all these mice cells. Some of the, some of the a subset were able to, to entrain calcium and form calcium channels 
in that process of the expansion and contraction. And because calcium is toxic, if it's in too high a level, a level it's, it's, um, it denatures lipids. So in, a, in terms of survival of the fittest kind of parlance, yeah, there was a subset that were able to entrain that calcium and make it useful. That's what biology is all about. So that's where the, that's where the, I mean, I know that the TikTok in biology is what you're describing. And I guess there would be ways in which to provide the, you know, the bridge between the very simple process of calcium flow in unicellular organisms and what happens, you know, in, in other, in a higher, hierarchical way to, to devise the, the, um, the nervous system. But uh, Jesse Roth, a very, very clever uh, NIH investigator, published a paper in the early 80s showing that neurons can synthesize insulin. So he was giving everyone a heads up that, you know, the, the genome is omnipresent. It's just a matter of which cell is doing what specialized function. So. Okay. Um, is anybody got any other questions? I, if not, I will put this video on YouTube. Um, John, if I send you the link, and you can you can link in to other things. Okay. Um, and um, there is a, yeah. Um, a John's. Um, I can't say this word. Q, Q cycle. How That's do you right. know? I say, it's just it's just bicycle with a Q U at the front, but my 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 brother says it should be pronounced quizzical. So pronounce Quiz it. Quizzical is better. Yes, quizzical is much better. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we thought we, we thought you'd intended that. Oh, partly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll send you the link, and um, I think um, I, what's what's been really great about our meetings is is just trying to put these things together which they they look like they should fit and um we're sort of we're trying the jigsaw pieces in lots of different ways to see if see if um, see how they fit and what it means i think what's remarkable is the synergy of things coming together at the moment it's not just our group or our group if you if you see what i mean but but um there are a few other groups as well yeah. and i think also through Peter, other groups are coming in and interesting people in, in the not too far distant future. I think before we know it, we might have a whole movement here. We've got to be careful. Yeah, no, let's not get carried away, but, but what, um, what an amazing thing the pandemic has been. That's all I can say. <laughs> but, but the point that hard. John is making, Mark, um, just to, re Ze uh, Zeb is not in the room, but I'll-, I'll No, Zeb isn't here. He made an interesting comment in our last Zoom. He was saying, well, you know, this is all well and good at a certain basic level. But once you step up, all of a sudden things get, you know, screwy, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that's, be I think that's because you have to start with the right initial conditions and have the right perspective in order to get to the next level. If it's not, if the ontology and the epistemology are not a fit, it's not going to work. No, so, true. yeah, I think we've found a way to interface these things, which actually does work and is predictive. Mm. So I think. Yeah, the weird things, things are coming together and things are falling apart all at the same time. This is very, very odd, very odd Indeed. time we're living in. No, no, Everything, not for you. Everything's, everything's going round and round in circles. Well, it could be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you ever so much, uh, particularly to Peter. Um, I, I will be watching that presentation a number of times and um, I've understood a lot more um, than I understood before today. So particular thanks to Peter. Um, and, and thank you to everybody else for coming and for asking questions and all the rest of it. And uh, we'll, we'll meet again, we'll, uh, our group will meet again next Thursday. And John, do you want to, do you want to advertise your next session? Well, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, if you like, uh, you, you, I, I'm about to advertise them. I've been promised uh, um, some, something from Lou, but we have sessions um, coming up on Saturday and Sunday, and we usually have these things at the same time every week. So if you want me to, Mark, I can send you a, um, a schedule for those and a way to meet them if you want to circulate them amongst the yeah. rest of the group. Okay, l l let's do that. Yeah. I, well, I hope so you... Sorry. So Luke Hoffman's talking on... Uh, on uh, 
on Sunday, and I think that would be a very interesting talk. Viv's, Viv Robinson's talking on Saturday as well. Okay. So uh, I say I haven't circulated those yet, but or alternatively, if you send me a set of emails of people who might be interested, yeah. I can include those. But it have to be quick, because I'm going to send it this evening. All right. Okay. That, that's right. the plan. Great. <laughs> so, what, what's Lou talking about on Sunday? Um, Majorana. Majorana. Okay. All right. Well, that's we'll work with on yes on Majorana on Majorana's Fermi on spinners and uh, the work that he and Peter have been doing together. So not Peter. marijuana, but marijuana. <laughs> Sorry, mar mar marijuana. <laughs> marijuana is a particle. We, we don't know, never mind, you never know. You might be talking about marijuana as well. <laughs> you never know with our. Well, I, I look forward to the talk on the marijuana the particle. The prizes are never to be excluded with our Lou. So uh, anyway, it's going to be a good week. Uh, okay. Well, circulate, circulate what's happening next Thursday with your group as well, please, Mark. I'd like to be on yeah. the list of being, yeah. at least being informed. Well, well, normally we don't do presentations, but I think today it was, it was really, it was very good to do today. I think it was a good thing. It's a beautiful one. Thank you, Peter, again. I always enjoy your talks. And yeah. As you say, it might be a prequel, but there's always one or two things that come up whenever you do a talk. So, uh, yeah. so thanks for that. Anyway, I'm going to go. So, all right. Good uh, to see you. All right. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Mark, about the editing of this talk, the yes. other group tend to cut out the beginning bit. Until yeah, I'll do that.